Hello and welcome to our continuing 2017 educational webinar series. I am Dr. Jill Brooks, Senior Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, a hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. Our focus this month is on regulatory compliance, ethics, and reputation. We are so pleased to have Kevin Fairley of Fairley Law discussing ethics and regulatory compliance. Kevin is the founding member of the firm where he practices in the areas of healthcare regulatory compliance, general healthcare counsel, corporate and transactional law with a special emphasis on the representation of EMS providers and agencies. He has represented healthcare clients and organizations across the country. He has served as counsel for numerous organizations undergoing both state and federal investigations involving state Medicaid investigation units, state attorneys <coughs> general office investigations, and the U.S. Department of Justice investigations involving Medicare fraud and abuse, false claims act, whistleblower, anti-kickback laws, antitrust issues, and allegations. From 2004 to 2014, he led the healthcare merger and acquisition activity for a private equity firm in St. Louis, which required, to serve him, which required him to serve as president of several healthcare corporations for the firm from 2010 to 2014. Mr. Fairley currently serves as general counsel and chief compliance officer to several health centers in the St. Louis area. Because Kevin has served both as CEO and general counsel to major corporations, he brings a unique perspective to his clients and understands the many decisions executives must balance in deciding the pros and cons of pursuing various legal and compliance strategies. A copy of his slide deck is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel. We will address these at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM CE certificate will be emailed to you from PACOM following the broadcast. There is no need to request it. Additional CEU opportunities will also be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. You'll need to check their website for details. Go ahead, Kevin. Thanks, Dr. Brooks. Uh, I didn't realize I gave you that, that big of a, a mouthful, but um, I appreciate the introduction. Um, so we're going to talk about some current trends in ethics and um, regulatory compliance. And um, I, I, I took this from a point of view, um, I wanted to tie in investigations and how to handle investigations. You know, let's, let's face it, we, of course, we all have compliance programs because we want to do the right thing. We also have compliance programs to avoid getting in trouble. So. I want to talk first about um, how to handle uh, investigations and some of the sorts of things that might uh, pop up with investigations. Uh, just a quick overview. I'm sure most everyone on, on the webinar is already familiar with these entities, but you know these are the type of folks that are going to come in and if there are issues, they're going to investigate. They're the ones that are going to be looking at your um, compliance programs, of course, the Department of Health and Human Services. Underneath that is uh, the Office of Inspector General, OIG, which we, we all are familiar with. Um, the Office of Civil Rights, that's the entity that's tasked with enforcing HIPAA. Uh, I'm not going to talk much, I don't think at all, about HIPAA today, but um, they are doing more investigations, more random audits. Uh, in the HIPAA world, so that's something to be familiar with. If you have somebody show up at, at your place and they've got a card that says Office of Civil Rights Investigator, it's probably a HIPAA issue. Um, <clears throat> the DOJ, the Department of Justice, those are the, the folks that would work hand in hand with the OIG and some of these other investigators. You know, that would be your local U.S. Attorney's Office and the Assistant U.S. Attorneys under that. And um, also, to, to uh, a greater extent, the local, the state Medicaid fraud um, units, I believe every state now has their own Medicaid fraud enforcement unit. So those, those folks may show up at, at your door, and to a lesser extent, state or local law enforcement. <clears throat> These are some of the current enforcement uh, trends that we're going to discuss today. Uh, the Medicare 60-day repayment rule. 
uh, folks are probably starting to hear more and more about that it went into effect in um, February of last year. And uh, as a part of the 60-day rule, they kind of go hand in hand, more emphasis on something called reverse false claims that I will um, talk more about. Uh, we're also seeing more and more of the, uh, especially from the U.S. Attorney's Office, the, the criminal side of those offices getting involved with these investigations and, and prosecutions. Um, definitely, I, I've seen this a lot in my practice, an increased use of data analytics. Uh, you know, for so many years, a lot of investigations were driven by complaints, whistleblowers, disgruntled employees. That certainly is still the case, but um, the the feds and and even on the state level have really invested into IT um, capabilities and, and data analytics. So they they look for things that are that are kind of out of the norm, and then they'll in, investigate those. Uh, and as I mentioned, it also increase on the state level with the Medicaid audit and compliance divisions. <clears throat> so. Uh, this is just an example of the, the what I'm seeing, what we're all seeing in terms of uh, uh, greater emphasis, emphasis on um, the criminal side of things. Uh, just last month, uh, the U.S. Attorney in Chicago announced that they were creating a new unit um, dedicated just to the prosecution of criminal health care fraud violations. Um, uh, they added five new individuals, five new attorneys, which is pretty substantial for those offices. Um, and so we're definitely seeing more coordination between these. It, it used to be primarily if, if we were dealing with a um, fraud, a healthcare fraud issue, it would usually be the U.S. attorney, the assistant U.S. attorney, that operated on the civil side of, of the office. Um, I can say, and I probably have currently about 10 different uh, clients that are undergoing the investigation by U.S. Attorney's Office. In every single one of those meetings, uh, they have had both the criminal U.S. Attorney and the civil U.S. Attorney in those meetings. That's new, that didn't used to happen. <clears throat> And so, as I was, uh, as I mentioned, Medicaid is has really ramped up as well, and um, a lot of that is due to an increased pressure from the feds for Medicaid to the, at the state level to get more involved with um, finding, detecting fraud. I've seen more and more. Um, collaboration uh, with the, the Medicaid folks and, and the feds working together um, more. And, you know, I, in the past year or so, I definitely have heard more from the feds saying, okay, make sure you're looking at this from a Medicare perspective, your clients need to make sure they're also dealing uh, with this at the Medicaid at the state local level. And there's there's more and more sophistication on the state level. Um, you know, I always say that Medicaid, you definitely need to take it seriously. It's not, it uh, doesn't raise the same concerns that Medicare does uh, in, in a lot of ways. They're just smaller and, and um, they don't have the, you know, the same amount of funds. But we're seeing more and more investigations at the, the Medicaid level. And these Medicaid fraud units, they have all the, the same ability to come in and investigate, um, um, to apply false claims, um, and I kick back all those sorts of things. They have, it's, it's still healthcare, it's still federal healthcare, healthcare dollars, so you definitely need to take Medicaid seriously. <clears throat> so I wanna talk a little bit about what do you do if if an investigator shows up at your door? Um, you know, I I see very often uh, folks that have good compliance programs. They know what they're doing, but when an investigator shows up, um, 
they aren't prepared for that piece of it. Um, investigators, the OIG, FBI, the Medicaid folks, um, they can they can just show up uh, at your office, talk to folks. Um, you know, sometimes they'll call and say that they want to have a, a telephone conversation. I've had I've had cases where an investigator showed up at an employee's house over the weekend when they're out mowing the lawn and start asking them questions. And of course, they're always going to say who they are. Um, they'll have a card and, and probably a badge and, and say, you know, tell them what they're, they'll say what they're there for and, and what kind of information they want. Um, and they're usually very, very friendly uh, as well. And, and it's their goal is to get people talking. So you need to make sure that your organization is educated all the way down to the lowest levels because these investigators often like to talk to folks at the lowest levels. So your employees need to know what to do when those investigators um, show up. And of course, you don't really want those em employees talking to the investigators until they notify a compliance officer, until they notify CEO, um, in-house attorney, if you happen to have one. It doesn't, you know, there's no hard and fast rule there. It kind of depends on the size of your organization. But you want any such contact being directed to a certain individual uh, who knows how to handle these things. <clears throat> and if you happen to be that person, if you're the executive director or you're the compliance officer, uh, you know, position that runs the practice, whatever that case may be, uh, you really don't want to talk to these individuals either. And I always say you want to be polite, cooperative, um, but you should tell them, and this seems self-serving for me, but, but trust me, it's important, you know, to say it's your company policy, it's your board of directors policy, whatever it may be, that you direct any such communication initially to your attorney or um, outside counsel, in-house general counsel, uh, again, whatever that case may be, uh, you, you don't want to start talking until you know exactly what it is that they're there to talk about. And, you know, let's face it, they're not going to just show up at your door randomly hoping to find something. If they show up there, they think that they already have information on you. So that's a critical first step for your attorney to take is to contact these individuals and, you know, say, hey, well, what, what is it that you're, that you're looking for? Um, and they will typically, you know, they'll, they'll tell the attorney generally what, what the issue um, might be. Again, by the time they show up at your door, they probably know more about your situation than you do at that given time. They have access to records. They've already looked at things. They think that they have a good case, and that's why they're at your, at your door. Once you have an idea of what the situation is, you've got to launch an aggressive internal investigation. You've got to find out what, if there's anything to it, if it's, if it's um, billing related, you're likely going to want to do some sort of third party billing audit. If you have a really good internal billing department that you trust, you're going to want them to, to do an audit and find out what exactly is there. Um, the other thing most likely you're going to do is interview any of the employees that might know something about this, uh, this situation. Because as this moves forward, the OIG, any of the investigators are certainly going to be interviewing or asking to interview your employees. <clears throat> and why it's critical to um, investigate and really wrap your head around what's going on is that internal investigation is going to drive your strategy in terms of how you respond to something. Um, you know, if if uh, 
it turns out that you've got an, an employee that that left a disgruntled employee and and you find out that that person was um, uh, mis intentionally miscoding claims uh, something that's clearly fraud uh, oriented then you may want to go through a self disclosure process that will that we'll talk about uh, you know if you do the investigation and and you determine look there was definitely no intent no no fraud here you very likely still have the 60-day rule that we'll talk about which is not as serious but you're going to have to determine whether there's um, overpayments and, and that sort of thing uh, and and then really depending on your investigation you know sometimes sometimes it makes sense to be very cooperative and and uh, forthcoming uh, other times you you are not you're not going to want to you're going to want to slow play it a little bit more and that all depends on the internal investigation so you really need to think ahead uh, if you haven't yet you know think about what happens if somebody shows up at your door next week are, will your employees know what to do will they know who to direct um, those people to and if you're the person they end up with what's your response going to be <clears throat> now sometimes these investigators will show up um, prior to a subpoena uh, that's definitely the case for um, a lot of my clients here recently they haven't gotten to a subpoena um, level yet and we hope that they don't oftentimes the very first communication that you get is they show up with their subpoena and this is just an, an example of one um, if you get a subpoena it has United States of America uh, the office of OIG and you read through it and and it says they're conducting an investigation into possible fraud you obviously want to take that that very seriously <clears throat> and it seems obvious uh, although I, I'll say with um, one of my clients it was a, a health center again large sophisticated they had a compliance department um, they got a subpoena just just like this uh, and came to me at the last minute had all the documents gathered and said hey we you know we just want to make sure you're okay with us sending off the information in this subpoena and they essentially handled it just like any subpoena from any attorney for for medical records uh, that's definitely not the way that you handle these sort of uh, subpoenas you want to know every single detail that's in those documents before they go out the door because the OIG is expecting to find certain things in those documents and you want to know to the smallest detail what's what's in those documents before they go out so a couple of the things that that are new and going on in this area um, is the OIG self-disclosure it's this is not um, entirely new there's always been a self-disclosure process um, the cite, citation here will take you to the actual document I think it's about a 20 page document that sets out the exact procedure for going through a self-disclosure process it's it's much more than just calling up the OIG and saying hey we think we found an issue of overbilling of hundred thousand dollars and we want to send that that money back there's certain audit processes that you have to go through um, and it's it's very detailed so it would make sense to be familiar with this document um, it's not used in, in all cases again it, one of the things that's required for the self-disclosure is you have to have some admission of, of wrongdoing so it's certainly used in cases of where you think that there's some serious underlying issues the reason for doing a self-disclosure is if you follow the proper procedures then it allows you to avoid fines and penalties that <clears throat> that go along with the False Claims Act uh, which is typically what's involved here and you know you can get triple damages and the fines and the penalties add up very quickly 
So if you've got a serious issue, you want to, you want to avoid those if possible. So the 60-day um, rule is, it came out again in, in um, February of last year. And essentially what the 60-day rule says in, in a nutshell is um, if you know or should have known that there might be a potential overpayment that you've received, then you have a duty to investigate and try and determine what that overpayment is. And um, once you determine what that overpayment is, you're required to make arrangements to pay that money back within 60 days. Uh, the, the name is a little bit of a misnomer. It's, it really is not that you have to return payment in 60 days. The 60-day portion of that is once you've made a determination, once you've identified the overpayments, then you have uh, 60 days to make arrangements to pay that back. And I'll detail that a little bit more in, in a couple more slides. Um, <clears throat> I have a link down here to the uh, U.S. Attorney Bulletin that came out at the end of last year. and uh, it is an overview of how the False Claims Act can um, be implicated by not complying with the 60-day rule. There's a citation there, um, but I wanted to, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in, in the next couple slides. <clears throat> One of the other things that came out of the 60-day rule is initially in the draft, it, it was if you've identified the overpayments, if you know that there are overpayments, then you're required to make arrangements to pay this money back. Well, the feds realize that they don't want people just taking the stick your head in the sand approach where you say, look, I'm not, I'm not going to do any internal audits. Why, why would I audit things just to find out I've got issues to, to pay it back with this rule that's implicated? Uh, so, they added language um, saying that reasonable diligence uh, is required and added the um, not only known but should have known and specifically in the in the rule it says that there should be proactive compliance activities um, on the part of any Medicare provider so for instance if if Medicare does an audit and finds out that you've been overbilling for the past five years, they come in and do an investigation, um, and you haven't had any sort of compliance program in place, you don't have any sort of auditing procedures to try and identify these things, they can say that you have violated the Medicare's rule for returning overpayments because you should have known through basic compliance activities that you were improperly billing. Um, so the head in the sand approach won't work. And really what this rule does is says that, to me, every single entity must have some sort of compliance program. It's really, uh, it's really not just an option or a best practice anymore. <clears throat> and the real kicker for the 60-day rule is something that's um, – called reverse false claims and of course under the federal false claim act if you submit intentionally submit claims um, that are false you can be uh, liable for uh, civil and criminal liability federal liability the reverse false claim is if you've received overpayment although you didn't intentionally submit false claims, you didn't intentionally um, miss code, but you receive these overpayments and you are generally aware that you potentially received overpayments and you don't do anything to repay the, the money, that is a reverse false claim under the False Claims Act. And 
the uh, citation I gave a couple slides ago is from um, a U.S. attorney. It happens actually to be the assistant U.S. attorney um, out of Kansas City. I'm, I'm based out of St. Louis, so uh, it's a U.S. attorney that I know. She wrote the guidance to all the U.S. attorneys around uh, the country on how they can use the Medicare 60-day rule and reverse false claims to prosecute individuals that receive money, don't do anything, don't follow the 60-day rule, and don't make an effort to pay that money back, that they can come after you um, for, for false claims. So Medicare 60-day rule is, is, is very, um, is very serious and you really need to be looking at uh, whether or not you're doing audits, what what sort of uh, procedures do you have in place to catch issues, uh, especially on the billing side, before they uh, move forward. So now I want to switch gears and um, talk about the guidance that came out from the Department of Justice earlier this year and it's it's guidance to the US attorneys to the Department of Justice on how they should evaluate corporate compliance programs if they go in to do an investigation if, if for whatever reason they're looking at a healthcare entity um, it's information to them on how they evaluate those compliance programs this slide has an overview of the guidance on on, on this. Um, it's the document itself is is lengthy. Um, there's several different sections with questions underneath each section, and we'll go into some of those here in the next few slides. Uh, it's not exactly new information. It's a lot of the same things that we know if you're involved in healthcare compliance. It's, it doesn't change really what compliance programs, how they should be structured, and um, you know the key elements of compliance programs. However, I find it extremely useful because there are very specific questions uh, in terms of what sort of things are they going to be looking for and what do they view as um, serious and important uh, portions of a compliance program. So I'm going to go over the, 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 the guidance breaks down different areas of compliance programs and then in these slides I have certain questions that are straight out of the document and then I'll provide you with a citation to the document um, uh, towards the end of the, of the slides. <clears throat> the first thing that they're going to look at Especially if they've come in, they've got an, an issue. Um, let's say that that they think that you've been upcoding cer a certain procedure for um, several years. They're going to want to ask, um, what does your compliance program have in place in terms of finding a root cause analysis? Uh, have you done anything, any sort of audits that may have identified this issue earlier on? Um, were there prior opportunities to detect the misconduct? Uh, again, audit reports, uh, what sort of controls were, uh, were in place to identify these issues? Uh, <clears throat> one thing that, that jumps out to me as an example here possibly is um, of course, there's always a focus on billing and whether or not you're billing appropriately. Another area that the feds are spending more and more time on is, uh, especially in the not-for-profit, obviously the not-for-profit world is grants and federal health care grants. And um, you have to comply with all the requirements of those grants. If you're getting federal dollars, you have to spend the money as you indicated that you would. Uh, I find that a lot of folks within their compliance programs 
tend to not think about grants and how are we monitoring, how are we checking to ensure that we're spending money the way that we are. And so that's an example of one of the things that they would look at here. Um, if, if this is a shock to you that we're in here looking at grant compliance, where were your controls ahead of time to make sure that you were complying? <clears throat> I, I think that this one uh, may be the most important. It's certainly the one that uh, that I preach, and in my own in my own practice, I've seen over and over. Um, again, I was in in private equity for around ten years. We would go in and and buy uh, troubled healthcare companies, usually with compliance issues, and have to go in and com clean up all those. Um, compliance problems and get the company turned around, it almost always uh, was a result of senior, especially senior, senior and middle management not being interested or invested in, in compliance programs. Not that they necessarily wanted to do something illegal. Actually, in most cases, that wasn't the case. It's just it wasn't, it didn't really want to be bothered with it. It didn't want it to be a focus. So these guys, the investigators, the U.S. attorneys, they're going to want to know, you know, the, the, the phrase, what was the tone at the top? Um, and they're going to figure that out, not by talking initially with executives or upper management. They're going to talk to the lowest level folks. And they're going to want to know. They're going to get their impression. Okay, what did the CEO, or what did the uh, medical director, what did you hear from them in terms of compliance and ethics? Uh, what's your impression of them? Did they, do you get the impression that that they're just all about the, the bottom line and the dollar? Uh, those are the sorts of questions that they're going to ask folks and start to build a case. Um, especially if this is something that's moving towards um, some sort of prosecution, they're not interested in the lower level folks. They're going to build a case for the highest level folks. So uh, if you're having trouble, if you're in uh, the compliance world in your organization and you do have trouble with getting the CEO or higher level folks, the board of directors really, really vested in compliance, I would I would take this section out of this compliance guidance, and these are specific questions that they that the DOJ says they're going to look at in terms of your organization. So that's pretty powerful if you can take this to the CEO or the board and put it in front of them and say, you know, how do you guys answer this question? Uh, so they also, and along the same lines as the as the upper level management, senior management, they're going to ask questions to, to see what sort of authority that the compliance program has. Um, what sort of, if the, is there a compliance officer? If so, is the compliance officer someone who is the practice manager who is already completely maxed out in terms of bandwidth and you just said, hey, you're also responsible for compliance? Um, you know, they're going to want to dig into how much um, authority the compliance department has, the compliance officer, um, what sort of stature within the company um, do they have, what sort of autonomy. Uh, if there's a board of directors, does, does the CEO or the board ever invite the compliance department in to do presentations? If the compliance officer wants a meeting in front of the board of directors, is that person going to be allowed to do that? Uh, there, that's going to certainly be a focus of the uh, DOJ. And again, they're not going to; these questions are not going to be answered by them going to the CEO and having the CEO tell them what their opinion is. They're going to start at the lower levels and find out what the what the true answers are. Uh, again, with the autonomy and resources, um, 
you know, em empowerment, uh, funding is also a is also a focus. And again, as they said in the introduction, this all depends on the you know the size of the organization. Uh, there are lots of factors to weigh there. If it's a small physician practice, uh, you know, it probably is not reasonable that they're going to go out and hire a full-time compliance officer that's, let's say, an attorney, a JD, and pay that person a, a, a ton of money. That's just not reasonable. Um, but you have to take into account the size of your organization and, and um, certainly give it the attention um, the attention that it needs so that that office is effective. Um, another thing that they that they do mention in this that guidance is if you're outsourcing compliance functions, um, which is which is acceptable, um, they're just going to ask the same sorts of questions. You know, why did you outsource the compliance function? You know, if you have a compliance consulting company, um, what was your what was your reasoning for hiring that company? Uh, and to me, what they're really getting down to is, did you just try and you know push this off on somebody else so you could check the box? Or let's say again that you're a smaller or medium-sized organization, it doesn't make sense. You're not going to have the skill set within your organization, and so you went out and found a reasonable, reputable um, outside organization that will actually move you further down the road towards compliance. Uh, that's the sort of thing that they would that they would want to find. So if you're outsourcing any of those functions, uh, you just you want to be able to demonstrate that you've gone out and found an organization that, um, that truly makes sense for for your entity. <clears throat> of course, policies and procedures. Uh, it's always going to be a key portion of a compliance program. Um, I think everyone's familiar with with policies and procedures and their importance. Um, again, I think some of these questions are are very helpful and very powerful, especially if maybe you're dealing with um, leadership that doesn't want to spend the time on the time and effort on some of these policies and procedures. It clearly can be time consuming to create policies and procedures to make sure that they're well done and, and that they make sense. So they're going to ask questions about, you know, who who's involved in creating the policies and procedures. And once they're created, uh, what what sort of impact, what sort of authority do they have? Uh, they're not really going to care if you have a compliance department and a compliance officer that writes the best, thorough, most well done policies and procedures. If that person sits in an office and does those and then puts them in, in a, you know, in a shelf in a filing cabinet and nobody else in the organization sees it, you know, except maybe at uh, new employee orientation, those aren't going to be effective uh, policies and procedures. So they're going to want to look at along the management chain, who has input in those, uh, what's the approval process. Um, once new policies and procedures are approved, then how are they implemented? Uh, those are all sorts of uh, the questions that they're going to look for. So it's certainly good to have policies and procedures, but you want to make sure that they have some, some teeth to them. Uh, training and communications tied in with the with the policies and procedures. It doesn't really matter if you have wonderful compliance policies, if you have, you know, a, a beautifully written code of conduct. If nobody in the organization knows about those, um, so training is is absolutely essential. Um, and again varies based on the size of the organization you know they're going to ask questions um, like is it is it uh, in-person 
training? Is it online training? Uh, if it's online training, you know, what's the, the content? How effective is it? Uh, and again, in my experience, they're going to get these questions answered by talking to the lower level employees. Um, uh, you know, they might, for instance, going back to an initial investigation, if they show up and just start asking your employees, start talking to them, and they have a specific issue that that they're looking at. So maybe it's a coding of, um, you know, a, a certain type of coding. They'll, they'll ask the employee, what's, you know, what's your company's, what's your organization's uh, policy on that? And if they employee can answer that, they're going to ask, well, you know, how do you know that? Uh, do you have access to policies? Are you trained on that? Uh, how are you updated on those? Those are all the sorts of questions that they're going to ask. <clears throat> Another absolutely critical element of uh, compliance program is the reporting mechanism. Uh, if your company doesn't have a um, confidential compliance hotline, an outside 1-800 compliance hotline, I think you need to go out today and get one of those. There are lots of options out there. They're very reasonably uh, priced. It's, it's not a, a major financial investment. And uh, you hope that it's effective. Um, you hope that employees will use it and report issues before they, you know, before they get too big. Um, if nothing else, it's a safeguard for you. Uh, if, if you have a compliance hotline and you promote it and employees know about it, uh, now, of course, I always, in my role in compliance with organizations, I always say, please, come to me first, and uh, I'll handle it confidentially. Um, but not all organizations have that option. So you definitely want employees to have the option to report somewhere. And if I'm defending an organization against an allegation and, and that organization has a compliance hotline, that's definitely something I'm going to be pointing to, to say, you know, hey, we, we made every opportunity available for employees to communicate this. Why didn't they go through the hotline? Why did they come to you first, you the investigators? That's a very powerful thing to be able to, to point to. Um, and, it, and let's face it, it somewhat discredits an employee that's making allegations when they didn't go through channels that you had available to them. Um, incentives and disciplinary measures, you know, these are these are true for compliance. They're true for really every sort of policy and procedure you would have within your organization, whether it be you know, human resources, employment issues. They're, they're going to want to see what sort, of, um, what sort of recourse is there for employees that don't follow your policies and procedures. Again, it doesn't, doesn't help to have policies and procedures if there's nothing to those. And um, incredibly important thing, and I preach this all the time, is consistent application. Um, you, everyone, management, executives, everyone needs to know what the policies and procedures are. They should know what the repercussions for not following those are, and they should be applied consistently across the board. Uh, and talked about audit quite a bit. You know, it's it's really just and it's essential that you have some sort of auditing, some sort of control testing. Uh, again, depending on your size, you know, maybe you have a large billing department that's run by some really talented people. It's fine to do internal audits, uh, but you should you should be auditing and looking for issues on a regular basis. If you're a smaller organization. You know, you can do a, a annual outside audit for not a whole lot of money, you know, for a few thousand dollars. I certainly think that that's well worth it 
to identify issues and um, correct issues before they turn into to big problems. Uh, you know, another word of caution, though, and I, I see this I see this quite a bit, is people actually go to the expense of doing audits. They get the audit information back, and they really don't do anything with it. You know, maybe they send out the results of the audits to the physicians, but with no real instruction on, okay, this is these are the issues that we found, this is what we think we need to correct, and this is how we're going to correct it. Uh, frankly, you're better off not doing an audit uh, than doing an audit and finding issues and not doing anything about it. So certainly keep that in mind. Uh, this is just one other <clears throat> issue somewhat kind of off the off the side here, but uh, something that a lot of organizations overlook. And um, you should be aware of your insurance coverage. Uh, again, going back to an investigation, if someone shows up at your door, you know, certainly if you get a subpoena, um, subpoenas, that, that can be very costly in terms of just getting outside attorneys involved. Again, I would recommend never turning over uh, information related to a, a DOJ subpoena without knowing every single detail that's in there. That often means going through thousands of pages of, of emails, sometimes hundreds of thousands of pages of emails. Um, and so corporate insurance policies will often, especially directors and officer, uh, officers, um, sometimes it's under employment practices, uh, liability, there will be coverage for the defense costs uh, of dealing with an investigation. Now they'll rarely, I'm not sure I've ever seen one that covers any fines and penalties that, that might come out of an investigation, but they often will cover the uh, expense of defending yourself in an investigation, which you know can add up pretty quickly. So I would recommend um, if you haven't or if you're you know, maybe someone else in your organization handles insurance, check with them and just ask your insurance broker or whoever handles your insurance to say, hey, if we have an investigation into healthcare uh, regulations, are we covered for defense costs? So just to wrap up um, real quickly, uh, you know, you, in a nutshell, these compliance, the whole purpose of, of compliance is to catch issues before they come too big. Um, you know, you're going to have to do that really through some sort of auditing, um, certainly audit of your billing. Uh, if you haven't in some time looked at your policies and procedures, go back and make sure that they're, they're up to date. Um, in terms of training, you need to ask yourself, well, how well do my employees know these policies? Uh, ask yourself, you know, hey, if an investigator showed up and started talking to my employees this afternoon, what are they going to tell them about what they know in terms of your comp compliance policies and procedures? Um, certainly document everything. Uh, document, document, document. Document your audit results. Document what you did in response to audit results, if you have um, disciplinary issues as a result of, of um, compliance issues, document that, document what you did so that you have a paper trail. Because, um, you know, trust me, you're not, employees turn over, people come and go, you need to be able to go to some sort of file and pull up exactly uh, what happened. Because a lot of these investigations, you know, they might be looking back certainly two, often five, six years in the past. So you need to be able to find your document trail. And finally, this is the link to the compliance guidance uh, that I discussed. It's much lengthier. I hit on some of the key elements, not enough time to do it all in one presentation, um, but it's pretty straightforward. It's just questions uh, under each, each section um, that you can look at and help, uh, help evaluate your own compliance program. And that wraps it up, uh, Dr. Brooks. Trying to see timing. Oh, good. Yeah. You got about uh, 10 minutes. 
Yep, and we do have a couple of questions. Uh, so regarding Medicaid fraud, uh, what would they be specifically looking at? Claims? Uh, if so, what types of coding signals a fraud instance? Well, they would be um, they would be looking at, at at any of your claims. It's uh, it it just would be the claims, obviously, that went to Medicaid. So um, I'm not aware of any specific types of claims that they are looking at. It really depends on your industry, but um, you know. Medicaid goes to the state Medicaid payer or maybe a Medicaid managed care plan um, and they have the authority to investigate Medicaid um, fraud or improper billing on the Medicaid level just as the feds do on the Medicare level. Uh, are the audit and compliance issues directed only at Medicare and Medicaid, or can an audit dive into our commercial payers as well? Commercial is is really an entirely different um, boat. Uh, the same, you know, the healthcare laws like the False Claims Act and that sort of thing. Those are all designed to protect taxpayer dollars and to protect. Um, federally funded programs so commercial commercial payers are um, are really entirely different uh, although you do need to keep in mind and sometimes it gets a little bit blurry uh, is this truly a commercial payer or is this a Medicaid or Medicare contracted managed care plan um, and so I would sort that out and, and it's the the Medicare and Medicaid uh, contracted plans, obviously more of the um, healthcare laws apply to those folks. But if it's purely commercial, that really gets down to more of the state law, um, con you know, just general contract law, what's in your contract with those folks. Uh, you know, so you don't want to ignore any investigations um, from those individuals, but it certainly, you don't have the same issues as you would with federal payers. Is there a standard for the number of billing audits the government views as reasonable and um, commenting on in-house versus a third-party audit? Um, there really isn't, uh, I have not seen guidance on, um, you know, say the size of your practice and and what they any sort of recommendation on the number of audits, whether it's in house or it's or it's outside. Um, it really uh, so. I have smaller um, clients that do just one audit per year. Uh, it really depends on on the size. Uh, I will say that if you, my impression is from an investigator standpoint, let's say you you did an audit um, just annually, but in that audit you identified some some serious issues. Well, you're going to implement say some changes. Um, you know, maybe it's internal training for your billing department. I'm probably I'm not going to want to wait another year audit that to see whether our changes are making a difference. So um, if you're identifying problems, then you're, I would recommend auditing more frequently. Uh, but there really, frankly, is not a hard and fast rule um, on the number of audits. It, in terms of defending folks, it's always nice to be able to say that someone uh, that your your client conducts an independent third party audit, that's really helpful. Um, you know, so I guess I guess really I would recommend at least on an annual basis hiring some third party to conduct an independent audit for you. Is there a difference between self disclosure to Medicare and the requirement to repay under the sixty day rule? Um, yes, yes, 
yes, there is, because, and I, I probably didn't hit on that quite um, quite as much as I should have, so I'm glad you got that question. Under the 60-day rule, uh, if you, if you through an audit or, well, really through an audit, if you find out that that you have received an improper payment, um, you know, maybe it was just, maybe it was an error on Medicare's part where they sent you a wrong amount. And there's really no underlying intent. There's no negligence. There's nothing like that. You certainly have to repay the money, but you're not going to go through the Department of Justice, through the OIG. That's really just a standard um, repayment with your, you know, your Medicare contractor or your Medicaid contractor. You're going to contact those folks and just say, hey, you know, we've got an overpayment issue. Let's you know, let, we'll send you a check or take it out of our, um, you know, out of our deposits going forward. So in a lot of cases with Medicare 60-day rule, it's going to be more of a standard repayment issue where you're just dealing with your Medicare contractor. The self-disclosure comes into play when you think that there's probably been some fraudulent activity. Are we supposed to have every single employee read our compliance plan and then sign off that they did, or can we just train them? We had been previously told that each employee had to actually read the document. Um, that may, you know, I could see somebody saying that that was a best practice. Uh, it's certainly not a requirement that they read um, everything, and actually, in my opinion or my you know real world experience dealing with compliance uh, if if an employee has to read the entire set of policies and procedures you know their eyes are going to glaze over about 10 pages into it so I'm not sure how effective that is um, I would make sure that you're training and hitting on the key points and um, you certainly want to have some documentation of that training which is probably an employee signature you know saying that they received the training uh, but I certainly don't think, in fact, I probably wouldn't recommend that they, they read all of your policies and procedures word by word. What is a good resource to reference when building a coding compliance policy? Um, I'm, you know, I, uh, Dr. Brooks, I don't know if your organization has um, something like that. You know, there's the there's the Healthcare Compliance um, Association. I imagine they probably have um, some products. I, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head that's like this is the gold standard, the go-to um, guidance on uh, on billing and coding. But um, you know, a reputable, reputable compliance consultant, or certainly you know maybe a state. Healthcare Compliance Association or the, the National Healthcare Compliance Association, I'm sure that they have very good resources on that. Okay, well that wraps it up um, for our questions and again Kevin's contact information is there on the screen. Please feel free to uh, reach out to him directly or if you reach out to us I will send them on to him. Uh, you can register for our future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at 1sthcc.com or give us a call at 888-543-4778. Thank you so much for joining us and again thank you Kevin. Thank you.